Think you can't eat carbs if you have diabetes? Think again, my friend. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for helping us make the world a healthier place. And it is, in fact, carb day here on the exam room. We are going to be putting them under the microscope, taking a close look at what they mean for people with diabetes. Are they these big villains that they're made out to be? Or is nutrition one big cast of characters where you've got some good guys there as well? And that means that not every carb is out to get you. We're going to be exploring that idea today with the master of diabetes from Mastering Diabetes, Cyrus Kambata, Ph.D., if there's a question that you would like to ask Cyrus, go ahead and post that in the comments or in the chat. We're going to be opening up the mailbag in just a little bit. You can also send them to me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Chuck Carroll, WLC in both places. Already some good questions coming in uh, for the mailbag. We have a question about blood sugar spikes and how they might compare say if you ate oatmeal to a breakfast cereal, right? That's an interesting one. What's the healthiest bread that someone with diabetes can eat? And can you prevent a blood sugar spike if you eat a donut and then follow that up with a fiber supplement? Gaming the system, we're going to find out. And the man with the answers is, in fact, our good friend from Mastering Diabetes, Cyrus Kambata. My friend, thank you so very much for being here. What's up? How you doing today, Chuck? It's good to see you as always. It's great to see you. Uh, before we dive into everything, I wanted to let you know that uh, one of our previous episodes is now one of, I believe, the 10 most viewed in the history of the exam room and even of all videos on the Physicians Committee's YouTube page. So thanks so much for being here again, man. You're, you're really doing some great work. Wow. I love that. That's actually really good to hear. I did. I mean, you learn something new every day and uh, who knew when I woke up this morning, I wasn't like, I had no idea that we were that good or that that episode was that popular. But the truth is that uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about diabetes in general. And there's a lot of misconceptions about carbs or carbohydrates in general. And I'd love to clear up as much of that stuff today as possible because the stuff that you find on the internet sometimes is just mind bogglingly complex and a lot of it is just biologically inaccurate. So we can get into detail for sure. Absolutely, man. So let's go ahead and start firing off these questions and raising those health IQs. Carly's wondering what carbs are safe for people with diabetes? Okay. So whenever you think of the term carb, let, let's, let's do a little bit of like reworking here because I don't actually like to use the word carb. Okay. Carb is just basically a shortened version of carbohydrate. And carbohydrate itself is not a food, okay? So when people refer to carbs, they can kind of confuse themselves because they don't really know what is a carb, right? Um, the truth is that there are things called carbohydrate-rich foods, which are foods that contain a significant carbohydrate content. And we're going to be talking about those. So you're going to hear me literally use the word carbohydrate-rich foods because that's a more technically accurate description. Now, Carbohydrates are found in the natural world. They're all over the place um, that you can find. If you go to a tree, a tree is predominantly made up of carbohydrate. The bark and the wood is carbohydrate. This piece of paper right here, this is carbohydrate, believe it or not. A tissue is, paper, uh, is carbohydrate. Um, foods that come from the natural world that human beings can eat are things like fruits and starchy vegetables and legumes like beans and peas and lentils, as well as whole grains. Those are carbohydrate rich foods that come from whole sources. And those are the types of foods that we strongly recommend increasing your intake of refined carbohydrate rich foods are things like cookies, crackers, chips, sodas, pastas, sugar, sweetened beverages, bear claws, pastries, things that you find in the grocery store that come inside of a package or a bottle or a can that had to go through a manufacturing process in order to become edible. Those are refined carbohydrate rich foods. And those have been documented time and time and time again in the scientific literature to not only increase your blood glucose, but significantly increase your risk for many chronic diseases, as well as cardiovascular disease and obesity. And as a result of that, you want to try and minimize your consumption of those foods while maximizing your consumption of whole carbohydrate foods, again, from fruits, starchy vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. Perfect follow-up then from Nyman. Uh, wants to get a little bit nerdy, man. You ready to get nerdy? 
I love getting nerdy. Let's right. let's be as nerdy as possible. All right, here we go, man. What is the mechanism behind refined sugar and diabetes? Woo, that's a good. Okay, we got it. We got some super nerds in there. Okay, so here's <laughs> the thing. <clears throat> What is the mechanism between, but behind uh, refined carbohydrate metabolism? Is that right? Yes. What is the mechanism behind refined sugar and diabetes? Okay. Here we go. Okay. When you consume food, you put food into your mouth, food travels down your esophagus, it goes inside of your stomach. Inside of your stomach is where food starts to get sort of ripped apart and partially digested, mainly through the presence of hydrochloric acid, which is basically a very acidic uh, enzyme. Now, hydrochloric acid then. I'm sorry, the food is partially digested. It turns into chyme. That's just the scientific name. It then goes into your small intestine. And inside of your small intestine is where the bulk of digestion occurs. Inside of your small intestine, you have enzymes that are secreted by your liver and your pancreas and your small intestine itself. And those enzymes are, are designed to do a couple of things. Number one, they want to take complex structures, whether they're fatty acids or carbohydrates, or protein and start to what's called denature them or basically linearize them. Once they are linearized, you can then have another set of enzymes that come in and start to cut those complex three-dimensional uh, structures into individual units. Those individual units are then absorbed through the walls of your small intestine. They're put in your blood and then they can go to their destination tissue. Now, in the case of glucose and carbohydrates, because that's the focus of our conversation today. Carbohydrates are molecules that can be anywhere from a few hundred uh, units long, all the way upwards of tens of thousands of units long. And they have a very complex three-dimensional three -dimensional structure. Now, these carbohydrates are acted upon by digestive enzymes inside of your small intestine, and they are basically linearized and then cut into individual glucose and fructose units mainly. There are many other units that come along. There are the other monosaccharides that usually end in the letters O-S-E. So it could be galactose, ribose, mannose, uh, again, fructose, glucose, xylulose, and beyond, okay? The bulk of the carbohydrate energy that you will derive, that you will actually convert into ATP, comes from glucose and from fructose. So you take carbohydrate structures, you break them into individual units. You then absorb those units through the walls of your blood. They get inside, I'm sorry, through the walls of your small intestine and they get inside of your blood. Once those are inside of your blood, the glucose and fructose are trying to get transported into their final destination, which is tissues like your liver or your kidney or your brain or your thyroid gland or your muscle tissue. Okay. Now this is where things get just a little bit Fun, in my opinion. Glucose wants to get inside of your liver and muscle and brain because those are the three most glucose dependent tissues in your body. Glucose can get inside of your brain with zero insulin required. Glucose can basically get shuttled into the, into, sorry, it can cross the blood brain barrier, get inside of neurons inside of your brain, and they don't require any insulin to make that process happen. And that's a good thing. In, in order to get inside of your liver and muscle, insulin has to be secreted by your pancreas. So insulin goes, knock, knock, there's some glucose in the blood, would you like to take it up? And liver and muscle cells can either respond by saying, sure, I'll take that glucose, or no thanks, I don't need that glucose right now, you can go away. So when you eat a refined carbohydrate-rich food, the refined carbohydrate-rich food is, again, high in carbohydrate energy, oftentimes high in glucose, high in fructose. And the kicker is that most refined carbohydrate-rich foods have a very small amount of fiber in them, okay? So you get a lot of glucose, you get a lot of fructose, but you get a small amount of fiber, you get a small amount of micronutrients. And as a result of that, that glucose and the fructose when it comes in is unprotected. It's not being protected by a sufficient amount of fiber. It's not being protected by a sufficient amount of micronutrients. And as a result of that, the amount of glucose and fructose from that food can get inside of your blood and can cause rapid elevations in your blood glucose concentration and your blood fructose concentration. In that scenario, when there's a lot of glucose and a lot of fructose, the first thing that happens is they hit your liver. Your liver is overwhelmed by the total amount of glucose and fructose that comes in from those refined foods. And as a result of that, your liver does whatever it possibly can 
to absorb as much of that as possible to protect other tissues from having to absorb excess glucose because it's very dangerous. So as a result of that, the glucose and fructose can come inside of your liver using small amounts of insulin. And then when they're inside of your liver, your liver says, okay, let me do whatever I can to try and uh, keep this glucose and fructose and then put it through a whole bunch of biochemical pathways that are going to prevent other tissues from getting assaulted. So that's when your liver is basically acting as like the savior for many other tissues in your body. And your, your liver can actually start to become very dysfunctional over the course of time. There's a process by which your liver can convert glucose into fatty acids over the course of time. It's, it's not really used that much, but when the amount of glucose that comes in, again, is very large in a short period of time, then that pathway gets turned on and it can become problematic. The last thing I'll say to this is that when you're consuming whole carbohydrate rich foods, the whole carbohydrate rich foods are protected. They're protected by fiber. They're protected by micronutrients and antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and water and uh, phytochemicals that come only from plant material. The presence of those micronutrients in addition to fiber slows down the digestive process and that is a good thing. And that means that when the glucose and fructose gets liberated from those foods and put into the blood, they don't overwhelm your liver and they don't overwhelm these, these alternative pathways inside of your liver that have to get turned on when there's too much available. So in this scenario, slowing the digestive process is beneficial. It's something that actually significantly improves the health of your liver in the long term, and it can prevent against rapid blood glucose elevations and can protect the health of your liver and your blood vessels in the long term. All right. So if that made sense. It, that's, that's great, man. So we've got glucose, we've got fructose, and I want to add one more to that, and that is mannose. As a man, those are some good answers that you were just given, man. That's a whole <laughs> lot of nutrition knowledge that you just dropped, man. That is fantastic. Thank you, my uh, man. Um, great follow-up question here from Tracy. Okay, so we're talking about uh, refined carbohydrates versus whole carbohydrates. But now Tracy's kind of like splitting the difference a little bit here. She's wondering how a blood sugar spike might compare if you eat a bowl of oatmeal versus an oatmeal-based breakfast cereal like Cheerios. Okay, so the question is, if I were to eat oatmeal or I were to eat some oatmeal-based breakfast cereal like Cheerios, which one is better? Is that the right question? Right, and how might the, the spike in the blood sugar compare between the two? Okay, the simple, the simple answer to that question is I want you to think, whenever you're trying to answer a question of like, hey, is this carbohydrate-rich food good for me or bad for me? There's a very simple way to think about it. All you have to do is take a look at the food and try and answer a very simple question, which is how much manufacturing had to go into making this thing edible? If you can answer that question and you can take a stab at it and give it your best answer, most of the time that's going to tell you whether or not you're consuming a carbohydrate that's actually beneficial and more healthful or a carbohydrate rich food that's actually going to increase your chronic disease risk. So in this situation, we're contrasting oatmeal versus a cereal that's made from oats with maybe some other things. Okay. Oatmeal is how the question is how much processing is required in order to turn oatmeal into oatmeal. Okay. Well, it turns out that there's actually many different types of oatmeal. There's the most unrefined version of oatmeal, which is called oat groats. And that is the type of oatmeal that I would recommend eating because that still contains the bran, the husk. It's got all the micronutrients on the, in the casing. And that's a good thing because it slows the digestive process down and it's got a lot of fiber. So oat groats is at the top. Next, you have steel cut oats. That's the second in the hierarchy. Steel cut oats is a little bit more processed than the oat groats, but that's okay. And it'll still be a healthful choice. Underneath that, you have rolled oats, which are the types of oats that you get at the grocery store that, you know, look like little sort of flat pancakes that you get from like the, the Quaker box. And then underneath that, you're going to have uh, instant oats, and then you're going to have puffed oats. As you go down that hierarchy, you go from less processed oat groats all the way down to puffed oats, which are the most processed of the oat 
um, you know, varieties. Now, when you're creating a cereal, okay, cereals look good. They got fancy marketing. They got this fancy box on the outside. They got all these words. They got protein, yada, yada, yada. But you got to think about, again, how much processing was required in order to make this cereal possible. And I can guarantee you that in most situations, most cereals require a significant amount of processing in order to make the, uh, the end product have the right crunch, the right size, the right texture, the right appearance, the right flavor. And so if you're eating a cereal that has some oats in it, but also probably has other things in it, chances are it's gone through more of a refining process and more of a manufacturing process to get to a point where it's a, it's a, it's less nutrient dense. And as a result of that, when you consume it, not only are you getting less nutrients, but there's more refining, which means that there's less fiber and having less fiber is actually a problematic scenario. And therefore in this situation, personally, I would definitely opt for the oatmeal rather than the oatmeal based cereal. And again, I'm not going to go for the puffed oats. I'm not going to go for the instant oats. I'm going to go up to the steel cut oats or the oat groats and try and find the most unrefined version of oatmeal. And when I do that, I can protect my blood vessels, my liver, my kidney, my muscle tissue, my heart, and my brain simultaneously. You are only going to get answers like that here on the exam room live. So if you're one of the hundreds who are joining us right now around the world, please go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the uh, Physicians Committee's channel here on YouTube as well. I mean, just phenomenal breakdown, bro. This is why people absolutely love you. Matter of fact, Joanna says, I don't have diabetes, but I'm addicted to the mastering diabetes videos. That, my friend, is when you know that you're given some good nutrition science, man. I that love it. She's like, I don't have diabetes, but I want diabetes just so <laughs> I can pay attention to this. Stuff. <laughs> I don't think she's going that far, man. Let, let's pump the brakes a little bit on that one. Uh, I also want to say hi to uh, Joanne, uh, finally making it to a live show for the very first time. That's very cool. Uh, Cherry is joining us in California. We've got Dana in St. Augustine. Teresa tuning in from Hawaii. That's very cool. Colleen is here and uh, Tofu Tuesday joining us on a Wednesday. Very cool as well. Go ahead. Keep posting your questions for Cyrus in the comments and in the chat. We got plenty of time here, so we're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, all right. So we're talking about whole carbohydrates. We just had the breakdown between refined and whole and why that matters in terms of oatmeal. But let's focus just specifically on the whole here. Uh, Vanessa is wondering if all varieties of sweet potatoes are safe to eat if you have diabetes. Ooh, the potato, the mighty, mighty, mighty potato. I'm so glad we're talking about potatoes. Potatoes are one of the greatest foods in the world for so many different reasons. Okay. Potatoes. There's so many different varieties. There's sweet potatoes. There's white potatoes. There's potatoes. There's red potatoes. There's yellow potatoes. There's black potatoes. You name it. They're different colors or different shapes, different sizes. Some are small. Some are large. Some are really heavy, some are light, you name it, okay? Um, we could do probably an eight-hour course or more in trying to figure out the biochemistry and how a purple potato slightly differs from a white potato and how a white potato is slightly different than a Yukon potato and a Yukon potato is slightly different than a red potato and so on and so forth. But we don't have the time for that and it's not that important. What is important to understand is that potatoes get a bad rap. Potatoes get a bad rap for many reasons. Number one, because potatoes are a carbohydrate rich food and the general world is terrified of eating anything that contains carbohydrate because again, they've been told and they've been brainwashed, if you will, into believing that carbohydrates are bad for you or carbs are bad for you, but you guys know better. Okay. So potatoes in general are carbohydrate rich, but you should not be scared of them. In fact, you should eat more of them because they're carbohydrate rich. Number two, potatoes are fiber rich. Fiber, again, is very important because it acts as a break and it slows down the digestive process. And that's a good thing because it lowers the speed at which glucose gets inside of your blood and gives you a much more favorable blood glucose response when you eat a meal. Now, sweet potatoes. There's many different varieties even within the sweet potato family. You got ones that have yellow flesh, ones that have purple flesh, ones that have uh, orange flesh on the inside, some that have darker fresh flesh. Uh, some that have white flesh on the inside. So the question is, are all sweet potato varieties good 
uh, good to eat and a, and a smart, healthful decision? And my answer is absolutely. All sweet potatoes, regardless of what color they are on the outside, what color they are on the inside, you have Cyrus Kambada's green light to eat sweet potatoes. But my the one thing that I will uh, put a, a little asterisk or a caveat in is whenever consuming carbohydrate-rich foods and whenever consuming a diet that contains a significant amount of carbohydrate con content in particular, the most effective thing that you can do is to eat carbohydrate-rich foods in a low-fat setting. And Dr. Neil Barnard has worked for years on this. Chuck Carroll knows this inside and out. Dr. Barnard has written multiple books on it. We wrote the Mastering Diabetes book on it. And there's ample scientific evidence to demonstrate that when you consume carbohydrates in an environment in which you are also eating a significant amount of fat, okay? The fat can come from things like olive oil or processed meats. It can come from dairy products. It can come from nuts and seeds and avocados, you name it. If you're eating a lot of those fat-rich foods and then in addition to those fat-rich foods, you try and eat a sweet potato or any other type of carbohydrate-rich food, your glucose will likely go high. So in order to enable you to tolerate carbohydrate more, in order for your carbohydrate tolerance to actually increase, which is a scientific term, carbohydrate tolerance, the way to increase your carbohydrate tolerance is to lower your total fat content. So you lower your fat content by minimizing your intake of nuts and seeds and avocados and coconuts, eliminating oil to the best of your ability minimizing or eliminating all dairy products, minimizing or eliminating all cheese, minimizing or eliminating all animal products. And when you do that, then your carbohydrate tolerance increases significantly, which means that when you go and eat a sweet potato, you can metabolize the sweet potato without your blood glucose doing anything strange. And that's the most important thing. So carbohydrates are awesome, but you got to keep that, that fat content nice and low. And by doing that, you can lower the amount of insulin resistance inside of your liver and muscle. And that's going to keep your blood glucose within the normal range 99.999% of the time. And that's exactly where you want to be. All right. So all sweet potatoes get the green light. But in, if you just had your druthers, right, and you could eat any sweet potato simply for flavor, are you a purple guy? Are you an orange guy? Uh, you go with the white Japanese sweet potato? Like which, which one are you going with? Okay. You want, to, you want to know the truth? Absolutely. I would actually prefer to eat white potatoes and red potatoes over sweet potatoes. And I know most people would not say that. Yeah. I know most people would not say that. But for me, the the flavor of like a like a russet potato that's been baked or like a Yukon gold potato or even a red potato, I would take that any day over a sweet potato. Don't get me wrong, sweet potatoes are good, but the other varieties to me are much tastier. I've got some baby red potatoes. I'm going to roast this afternoon right up there in the kitchen about 20 feet away, man. I'll send some to you. There you go. I'll take them. I'll take them every day. <laughs> uh, Pat, I love your program, Chuck. So happy to finally have made it live. Awesome. Glad you're here. Uh, Pat also says, love you, Cyrus Kambata. So, uh, yeah, Pat, I love you too, man. That's pretty dope. Uh, all right. Uh, so we've talked potatoes. Let's talk fruit here. Are there any fruits? Sam is wondering this. Are there any fruits that someone with diabetes should not eat? Ooh, this is another good question. Okay. Just like potatoes, potatoes have, again, have been sort of like painted as the boogeyman of the like fruit and vegetable world because there's too many carbs and the carbs are bad for you and they're going to make you fat and they're going to make you more diabetic. Fruits fall into the same category. People will tell you all across the internet, you'll see this left and right on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook, you name it. People will say, don't eat bananas because bananas are all sugar. Don't eat mangoes. Mangoes are all sugar, okay? Don't eat melons because melons are all sugar. And what they want you to believe or what they honestly believe themselves is that uh, a fruit, if you were to just sort of like grind a fruit up, it would just literally turn into like a pile of white table sugar, which is from a, from a biological perspective, as far from the truth as possible. Again, fruit contains a significant quantity of carbohydrates. Fruits are carbohydrate rich foods, and that's a good thing. But in addition to the carbohydrate energy that you get from eating fruit, you also are getting 
protein energy, okay, which are amino acids that are locked up in these things called proteins. You are also getting fatty acids, which are locked up in a thing called triglyceride, okay? You are also getting vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. So if you really think about what a fruit is, a fruit is a combination of multiple macronutrients and micronutrients, and the combination of all of that together is actually a very complex three-dimensional package, a th complex three-dimensional matrix, if you will. And when you eat that food and it gets inside of your small intestine to be fully broken apart and digested, it takes time. And time is your friend. Again, if we contrast that against a soda or a, a, a pastry or a cookie that you get from the grocery store, those have gone through a manufacturing process. They contain less micronutrient density, less fiber, if any. And as a result of that, they can be metabolized very quickly and speed is not your friend in this scenario. So to go back to the original question, are there any fruits that I should avoid? My answer is absolutely not. All fruit, literally all fruit. I don't care what color it is, what shape it is, what size it is, how carbohydrate dense it is, how much water there is, how much water there isn't. It doesn't matter. All fruits are technically speaking green light foods as far as the Mastering Diabetes Program is concerned, as, as far as we classify them. All of them contain vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, micronutrients, triglyceride, protein, and carbohydrate simultaneously. And that is a very good thing. And that's why when you're consuming fruits, I don't want you to think, oh, well, this is going to turn into sugar because that is not a true statement. All those other protective macro and micronutrients that come along for the ride are there to help you in the digestive process, slow down the metabolism of glucose and fructose into your blood. And that right there protects you against chronic diseases like diabetes and many others into the future. All right. Mauna Kiki is taking it then to the next level with the fruit, wondering what your opinion is on a, a fruit exclusive diet. Oh, okay. Um, real quick before we get there, there's a comment from Richard that I just saw. It says, Hey, Cyrus and Robbie, I re reversed my prediabetes and hypertension by switching to a whole food plant-based diet and losing 150 pounds. Yeah. That's absolutely. what I'm talking about. Richard, that's unbelievable work. I'm, I'm really proud of you actually. And the truth is that the way that we describe to eat, which is again, low fat plant-based whole food diet, which is very similar to exactly how Dr. Neil Barnard and the PCRM entire ecosystem functions is that when you consume these foods, you can maximize the opportunity of number one, losing weight, number two, lowering your blood glucose, number three, lowering your A1C, number four, lowering your blood pressure, number five, lowering your cholesterol levels, and number six, as Dr. Will Bolsowitz will tell you over and over and over again, significantly improving the, mic the, the, the diversity of your microbiome, which is gonna have untold benefits for all tissues within your body. So you can never go wrong by increasing your whole food intake. Right on, man. Right okay. on, dude. That's the, I, I love stories like that, man. I, yeah, it just makes my day. Makes my day. Absolutely. Uh, fruit exclusive diet. Where do you weigh in? Okay. Fruit exclusive diet. Truth be told, when I first became a raw food, sorry, when I first became a vegan back in 2003, I actually ate a raw food diet. And then the raw food diet is very high in fruits with some vegetables to come along for the ride. So I was never eating a 100% fruit only diet. I was eating a predominantly fruit diet with some raw vegetables to come along for the ride. Now I'll tell you one thing, I freaking loved it. I loved every second of it because there's a lot of like very delicious foods that you can eat, keeps you extremely high energy. You're able to work out as if you enjoy exercise, you have a lot of energy to be able to you know use for physical activity. And that's always a good thing. Um, a fruit exclusive diet takes it to one uh, a one more extreme, if you will, I don't like to use that word, but a, a little bit more um, restrictive in the sense that you're eliminating all vegetables and you're literally eating nothing but fruit. Personally, I would not recommend that approach. I would not recommend that approach for many reasons. Number one, vegetables have, I mean, there are, there's a whole wide, there, there are thousands of vegetables and there is plenty of evidence-based research that demonstrates that consuming vegetables actually has a very powerful effect at boosting overall function, boost, boosting overall immune function, and lowering your risk for many chronic diseases. So because it's such a beneficial food category, I would not eliminate that from my diet. 
personally speaking. Number two, when you eat a fruit only diet, you are also not consuming legumes, beans, lentils, and peas. The blue zones have taught us. Dr. Will Bolsowitz has taught us and many other experts on gut health have taught us that legumes are some of the most micronutrient dense foods that we know of. And they have very, very powerful effects at improving your overall gut function. And that is a very good thing. Number, number two, legumes also are very effective at helping to keep your blood glucose values nice and stable over the course of many hours. So if you eat a legume right now, or you eat a legume, you know, collection of legumes for, for lunch over the course of the next six to 12 hours, your blood glucose is likely to be more stable than if you were eating uh, a meal that had less legumes in it. And Dr. Joel Furman has also talked about the fact that there's this thing called the second meal effect, which means that if you eat legumes at this meal, at your second meal, you actually have a carryover effect. And a lot of the benefits that you got from that first meal are still present inside of your microbiome. And that can be very beneficial at helping control your short chain fatty acid production, your glucose production and beyond. So my point is this, if you can eat a diet that includes fruits, I'm all about it. But I would personally not recommend eliminating either vegetables or legumes. We didn't even get into whole grains, but I would not eliminate them either. The combination of fruits plus vegetables plus legumes plus whole grains is a winning combination. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no reason to necessarily eliminate three out of those four categories. People just want to talk about fruit today. Uh, Nadia at uh, 1230, what's the best way to eat fruit? Is it raw? And is it okay to combine a number of different fruits while you're eating them? Can you eat them together? Yeah. Oh, this is a great question. Okay. <clears throat> so yes, eat fruits as raw as possible, otherwise known as a wrap. Okay. Um, but secondarily, um, if you really get into the like fruit world, there's actually uh, some food combining rules, if you will, that basically say, you know, they, they take fruit and they classify them into one of four categories. You either have your, uh, your sweet fruits, your subacid fruits, your acid fruits, and then there's actually a fourth category called melons, just pure melons, right? And so what you want to do is basically like only combine fruits from any two categories that are adjacent to each other, but try not to skip a category. Now, that's a whole, uh, the, the reason for this fruit combining rules is based off of digestive biochemistry. And the truth is that it works most of the time, but there are for some people, they're like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. I can have some melons and I can eat with bananas. I can have some bananas and eat them with oranges. It doesn't really matter. And so the answer is for the most part, combining any and all fruits together should do you just fine. But if you are finding that when you combine certain combinations of fruits together, it can be a little bit more problematic and it might cause you some digestive distress. Then I would recommend looking up these food fruit combining rules and then being a little bit more adherent to them. And then that might help you out in the long term. Joanne, 1235, is blending fruit into a smoothie going to speed up digestion too quickly? Okay, so blending fruit into a smoothie will definitely increase the rate at which glucose enters your blood. There's no question about that. Does that mean that you should never have a smoothie? Absolutely not. If you're going to have a smoothie, here's what I would recommend doing. Don't drink your smoothie with a straw. Don't drink it with a cup. Eat it with a spoon. So let's say you make a blender full and you got this giant smoothie and you pour it into a cup or you pour it into a bowl. What I would do is I would take a spoon and I would put the spoon inside of the cup and I would take one spoonful at a time. What that does is it forces me to slow down the rate at which I'm actually putting that into my mouth. And that's going to go a long way in trying to prevent your blood glucose from doing funny things in the next couple of hours. Um, I personally make a smoothie bowl almost every single day. But I'm also pretty uh, strategic in that I will only really consume a smoothie bowl if I am in the post-workout state, meaning I've gone and I've done my workout and I've gotten my, you know, my heart to be beating significantly. So my cardiovascular metabolism has already been turned on. My muscles are extremely hungry. In that situation, consuming smoothies and or smoothie bowls is going to be a much safer option simply because your muscles are extremely hungry and they can start to absorb a significant amount of that glucose energy for free without using very much insulin. So if you can sort of time it after exercise, that would be smarter than just having it at any moment of the day. But again, the pace at which you eat it really matters. So that's my recommendation. 
Plant Base Sixties is uh, showing us some love right now. Love the exam room. This show is awesome. Love you too. That's awesome. Thank you so awesome. very much for sharing that. Uh, question that. from uh, Ayla here, twelve twenty eight. We haven't talked about corn yet. Uh, Ayla says, uh, "I've heard that corn should be avoided because of its sugar content." Where does that rank here in terms of foods that are green light, yellow light, red light? Where is corn on that scale? Okay, corn is one hundred percent in the green light category. Um, again, people have been sort of told that corn is bad for you because corn's going to metabolize to sugar. It's the same thing as fruit. It's the same thing as potatoes is bad for you. The truth is from a biochemical perspective, corn is a complex food. It contains, again, vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, phytochemicals, plus triglyceride, plus protein. And the combination of all of that is going to help slow down the digestive process. So don't, over if you're going to not eat corn, don't not eat corn because it's carbohydrate rich. Some people choose not to eat corn because the majority of corn that you find in the grocery store today is either GMO'd or it has been, it's a, it's a hybrid version of corn that's been bred and bred and bred and bred and bred many, many times. And as a result of that, its micronutrient value has decreased. So uh, if you, if you choose to avoid corn, do it for those reasons. But I personally consume corn. We recommend eating corn for all of our, uh, all of our people. And if you can find corn, uh, in, in an organic state that I would, I would recommend doing that, um, rather than, um, trying to take on some GMO corn that may or may not have, uh, deleterious effects in the long term. All right. I want to go back and do some housekeeping on something you and I were talking about a little bit earlier. You're talking about eating a really fatty meal, but then having this whole carbohydrate on the side, but then boom, you still see that big spike. But now big ant is like, all right, cool. I got you. But what if that fat source is in fact, whole food plant-based like an avocado? Mm -hmm. Will you still see that, that spike there? Okay. So the answer is it will be better, right? I would prefer that you eat an avocado rather than having a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. I'd prefer that you eat an avocado rather than chicken. I prefer that you have an avocado rather than ice cream. No question about it. But there comes a point at which any fat rich food, even if it's from a whole food plant-based source, like an avocado or a coconut or nuts and seeds can overwhelm your ability to metabolize carbohydrate. It's just a flat old, it is a, uh, it is a mammalian biochemical problem. For some reason, mammals, you know, human beings, cats, dogs, monkeys, mice, sheep, all of us that are in the mammal category suffer from the same problem, if you will, which is that carbohydrate metabolism and fat metabolism do not play nice with each other. When you operate in the carbohydrate economy and you are consuming a significant amount of carbohydrate energy, it is very important to keep your fat content low. So you want carbohydrate high, fat low. That's the only way to make carbohydrate metabolism work for you in the long term. There's literally no other way to do it. If you consume to eat a fat rich diet instead, then I would highly recommend lowering your fat, your, your carbohydrate content. So that way fat is high and carbohydrate is low because again, the two of them do not play nice with each other. So my suggestion to you would be, even if you are eating plant rich fatty acid foods, limit your intake of them because number one, a little bit goes a long way. But number two, if you're trying to eat too much of that, then your carbohydrate metabolism is going to get adversely affected and your blood glucose is likely to do some very weird things. So then like, what is the balance there? Because obviously there are certain fats that, that we need like omega threes, right? So you mm -hmm. add flax to something like that, that's going to jack up the content there. You, you still need those. So like, how does one find that balance? I'm sure that that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's a, it's a great question. And so we've done the math on this and we've worked with thousands of people and, you know, I've done it, you know, for the past 20 years myself living with type one diabetes. And I can tell you this, the simplest way to think about it is just to like make this dirt simple on a daily basis. We recommend eating no more than 30 grams of total fat period. End of story. Okay. So you can just remember that number 30 grams of total fat from your diet, from all foods within a 24 hour period. If you can contain your total fat intake to being less than 30, you're doing the right thing. Number two, Within a 24 hour period, if you want to ensure that you're getting a significant amount of omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, which are very beneficial for brain health and eye health and nervous, system, nervous tissue health, then a simple way to do that is to take 
two tablespoons of ground chia seeds or two tablespoons of ground flax seeds and try and freshly grind them as much as possible and then add that to your foods over the course of 24 hour and then eat it. Boom. Micro, uh, sorry, omega-3 micronutrients already taken care of. Okay. So the truth is that this game is not that complicated. It really does not have to be that complicated. It's just that it can become very complicated when there's too much information and too many different people saying too many different things. So again, 30 grams or less per day and have two tablespoons of freshly ground chia seeds or freshly ground flax seeds per day, you're covered. You got your entire fatty acid profile completely, uh, you know, it's, it's adequate. It's actually beyond adequate. And you don't necessarily have to worry about developing an omega-3 deficiency over the course of time. And uh, then, you know, you can also be as insulin sensitive as possible and keep your carbohydrate metabolism in check. All right. Let's see if we can grab a few more from the exam roomies here. Uh, we talked, uh, well, we haven't talked about meal timing. We've all heard about meal timing, but let's talk about fruit timing. The Kitchen Witch at 1240. Is there a time of day that is better for fruit? Um, yes. When you're awake is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> you can have fruit at any time of the day. Don't Any time of the day. Don't worry about it. Don't overthink it. All right. Uh, question from Tamina. Okay. Oh boy. I've been waiting for this one. If I take a fiber supplement yeah. while I eat a donut, mm -hmm. can that prevent the sugar spike? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a great question. Actually. Uh, one of my favorite comedians of all time, his name is Mitch Hedberg. Uh, Mitch Hedberg basically has this joke where he goes, he goes, man, I wish you could eat a good food and a bad food and the good food would cover for the bad food on the way down. Like you could eat an onion with a carrot. I'm sorry, an onion ring with a carrot. And the carrot would be like, oh man, it's all good. He's with me. Don't worry about it. He's safe, right? <laughs> I wish that that was the case. I wish that you could eat a good food and a bad food and the good food would literally cover for the bad food and everything would be fine. But the truth is that uh, you can't really negate the effects of a, uh, a fried food. You can't negate the effects of a nutrient rich food by simply covering it up with a nutrient. I'm sorry, a nutrient poor food by covering up with a nutrient rich food. So in this scenario, you're saying, if I eat something that has no fiber in it or very little fiber, then I just take a fiber supplement. Well, shouldn't that just like mathematically work out to my advantage? And the answer is no, it doesn't for one main reason. The fiber that you get from food is different than the fiber you get from a bottle or a supplement. The fiber you get from a bottle or a supplement, whether it's Metamucil or whether it's something that you found at the grocery store, that fiber is far less functional in your digestive system and your microbiome than if the fiber were already fully integrated into a food and you just ate the whole food, okay? In order to get the fiber inside of a bottle, the fiber had to be processed in the same way that we were talking about oatmeal earlier having multiple levels of processing, okay? So fiber is... Even though it's technically fiber, fiber can be processed when taken in supplement form. And as a result of that, when you consume that fiber, it doesn't nearly have the protective effect that the fiber in whole food does. It doesn't slow down absorption to the way, in the way that I suggested. Number two, it doesn't bulk your poo in the way that it would coming from uh, whole food sources. And number three, it doesn't serve as a sufficient fuel source for trillions of bacteria inside of your microbiome which is very necessary for them because that's literally a fuel that they use in order to make these things called short chain fatty acids. So I don't want you to fool yourself into thinking that just by taking a fiber supplement that all of a sudden you have this insurance policy and everything's going to be just fine. I would much prefer that you get fiber from food. And when you do that, trust me when I say glucose metabolism will be better. Fatty acid metabolism will be better. Cholesterol will be lower. Microbiome function will be better brain function will be better, cardiovascular function will be better, liver function will be better, and kidney function will be better. No questions asked. So much great information there. And what stuck with me is bulk your poo. I don't know what that says about me, but I mean, <laughs> you are just a wealth of knowledge on so many different levels, man. Um, all right, let's grab two more here. Um, 
Let's start with uh, Plant Based by 30. Sent this one to me on Instagram at Chuck Carroll WLC. Uh, they are wondering what is the healthiest bread? They specifically asked about sourdough bread, Ezekiel bread, no bread at all. What's the healthiest option here for someone with diabetes? Okay, cool. So if you again, if you're going to want to consume, if you're going to want to have some bread, I'm not going to say no to having bread because there are more healthful varieties of bread than there are. Is bread a processed uh, food? The answer is yes. Bread is absolutely a processed food, but just because it has some processing, uh, required does not necessarily mean that it's something that you should completely avoid. So if you choose to have bread in your diet, absolutely. The Ezekiel products are phenomenal. The Ezekiel products come with sprouted grains and sprouted nuts and sprouted seeds. And that's always a, a, a tip top option because they do their best to limit the amount of processing in order to turn it into a, uh, in order to turn it into something edible. There's also another uh, brand called, I think it's called Dave's Killer Bread. And that's also very micronutrient rich as well. So if you want to get some of that in your diet, you can do that as well. Um, sourdough bread actually is partially fermented. And that's a good thing because the fermentation byproducts are actually food for your microbiome as well. So if you choose to have some sourdough bread, then try and you know, get maybe the, as organic of a sourdough bread as you possibly can and have small amounts of that. And that's also a perfectly good option. So um, yeah, don't, don't necessarily avoid bread, but if you choose to have it, just try and make sure that you're getting the, the, the smallest amount of processing. And then that right there can help out multiple tissues at the same time. All right. And the last question is going to be kind of a combination of a couple of people who have been asking in the chat room, uh, the concepts that we've been talking about today. Um, do they apply to everyone kind of regardless of age? We have Emily who has a six-year-old child who has type one diabetes. And then somebody else was talking about their elderly parents and whether they should be exploring eating this way as well. The concepts that you and I have been discussing here today, are they universal regardless of age? It's a great question. It's a phenomenal question. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember where I learned this from. I believe I learned this from, there was a Joe Rogan podcast in which James Lightning Wilkes was uh, debating versus Chris Kresser. And it was a three hour long, like unbelievable debate. And there was one moment in that debate where they were talking about the specific issue about whether or not a, a predominantly plant strong diet is good for, you know, people of all ages and all shapes and all sizes. And what some of the research demonstrates is that there is no time in the human life cycle for which a plant-based diet is not beneficial. I'll say that again. There is no time in the human life cycle for which a plant-based diet is not beneficial. Okay. A plant-based diet can not only meet your nutritional requirements, but exceed your nutritional requirements at all stages of the life cycle. Literally from the time that you are three days old and you are receiving breast milk from your mother all the way upwards of being 97 years old and um, you know, thinking that you're too old for plant-based nutrition to work for you. We personally have worked with people all the way upwards of 85, 90 years old, and we've gotten some of our best results from people who thought that they were too old and that they, could, we, they couldn't change their health by changing the food that they ate. Completely wrong argument, okay? Um, we've also seen, we also have a program for kids that are living with type one diabetes because they benefit from making very strategic nutritional changes at a very young age, because it's, it's important for them to not only control their blood glucose and to make their parents' life easier, but it's also very, very important for optimal cognitive development and cardiovascular development from a young age. So the answer is yes, absolutely. At any point, whether you're three days old or you're 160 years old, it doesn't matter. Eating a plant-based diet can always benefit you. And unless I'm presented with information that shows me otherwise, there's no reason to believe that there's any age that should be excluded. And you know what I love is that someone, for example, today would could have diabetes for years and years and years, decades, but it doesn't take decades to get back on that healthier right. track. You can see significant improvement a lot sooner than you would expect. And I think that that's kind of at the heart of your six week blood sugar transformation challenge, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up actually, because we regularly host online events and um, we have in-person events and we also have a coaching program. 
And um, when, when we first created this program, I'm going to be the first person to tell you that I saw rapid changes in my health when I had transitioned to a plant-based diet. So I'm a guy who's been living with type 1 diabetes for one year. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me switch over to eating a plant-based diet. And I did. And within 24 hours, my glucose fell so sharply that I had to back off on giving myself insulin very, very quickly. Within the first week, I was down by like 35 to 40% on my insulin use, which is bonkers for somebody living with type 1. Now, I didn't necessarily know if my experience would translate to other people. Would it translate to other people who are living with type 1 or prediabetes or type 2 or gestational diabetes? You name it. I didn't know the answer to that question. But what, what, what we have found over the course of time, anecdotally from working with now more than 10,000 people, is that your, the human body is an exquisite machine, unbelievably exquisite machine that can handle and tolerate and put up with inflammatory conditions and really suboptimal behavior for many, many years. Okay. You can be eating a micronutrient poor, high fat, high processed food diet for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And then at that point you switch your diet and then all of a sudden, boom, you start switching your diet, putting in micronutrient rich foods, more fiber rich foods, more carbohydrate rich foods, lower your total fat content and just eat more naturally. And within weeks, okay, again, 50 years of damage. And within weeks, you can start to see significant improvements in blood glucose, significant measurable improvements in blood glucose, significant reductions in A1C value. And if you fast forward to like the two to three month marker, that's when you start to see significant improvements in lipid metabolism, aka less cholesterol in the blood, less LDL. And that's always a good thing. So we constructed a thing called a six-week blood sugar transformation challenge. And we've been putting people through this program and people's, pe people are losing their minds because they're like, you telling me that I've been living with prediabetes for the last 15 years and all I had to do was this six-week long thing and all of a sudden my A1C fell for the first time in 15 years? Why did my doctor never tell me that? You're telling me that I've been living with type 2 diabetes for 40 years and I've been using metformin and a couple of other oral diabetes medications and all I had to do was this six week long experience and now all of a sudden my A1C fell by 2%. I didn't think that was possible, right? So we see this over and over and over again and I'm the first person to tell you that it is, it's a phenomenal process. I love helping other people and just like you, you know, we feel compelled to just share this information with as many people as possible because there's so many positive benefits that can come along with eating a plant-based diet that you just can't ignore it. Dude, no, you, you, you want to put it out there, man. And, and, and it is that compulsion to help people. It's the healthiest compulsion that I think a person could possibly have, you know, yeah. it's like, I feel so privileged to be in the position that I'm in and to have had the transformation that I have that I absolutely want to pay that forward. I use that phrase all the time on the podcast, pay it forward. And I feel like every time we do an episode of the exam room, that's exactly what we're doing, right? Because everybody deserves to feel this good. You know what I mean? There's no question about it. There's no question about it. Everybody deserves to feel this good. And there's just a lot of programming and there's a lot of like societal pressure and societal misinformation that a plant-based diet is, is bad for you. And a plant-based diet is going to feed you a bunch of anti-nutrients and it's going to make you, it's going to worsen your health. But Amen. trust me when I say that could not be farther from the truth. Amen. It could not be farther from the truth. No question about it. And look, there's no doubt about it. School was in session today, but coming up August 18th through the 20th, we're talking like all kinds of master classes, 30 speakers over the course of three days. Cyrus, I know you and Robbie will be presenting at the International Conference of uh, on Nutrition and Medicine as well. That's in Washington, D.C., August 18th through the 20th. Don't think you're going to be there in person, but your presentation is going to be extraordinary. Nonetheless, Absolutely. I think you're teaming up with uh, Dr. Brian Carlson, who was just on the show, right? That's exactly right. We're going to be with Dr. Brian Carlson and then uh, Robbie Barbero and myself. We're going to be talking about everything you want to know about type 1 diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes. And we're going to hit it from sort of three different angles and have a really good time and share personal stories and also a lot of the biochemistry so that people can really understand the benefit of a plant-based diet when trying to maximize insulin sensitivity. Now, Dr. Carlson will be there in person. You're going to be remote, but nonetheless, an extraordinary experience 
30 people over the course of three days. And we're going to be recording episodes of the exam room live all three days as well. There's going to be so much to do. Come join us in Washington, D.C. Watch us do the show live. It'll be great. And then soak up all of that information that's going to be talked about. Really take that health IQ to the next level. You can book your seat right now. Limited seats are still available. PCRM.org slash ICNM is the place to go. PCRM.org slash ICNM. A uh, couple of names that will also be speaking there. Uh, Neil, Dr. Neil Barnard, he's going to be there. Dr. Alan Desmond coming all the way uh, across the pond to join us, as will Dr. Gemma Newman, Dr. Robin Chutkin, both of whom will be on the show very soon. Uh, Dr. Hanna Kaliova, um, Dr. Kim Williams. I mean, just so many people. The list goes on and on and on. So PCRM.org slash ICNM is the place to go to save your seat. Come join us in Washington, D.C., August 18th through the 20th. Hang out. We're going to be recording episodes. Would love to meet you. Say hi. Meet all the exam roomies. It would be phenomenal. Uh, but uh, Mr. Cyrus Kambata, sir, this is all the time that we have today, man. Thank you so very much for being here and really schooling us up when it comes to diabetes, bud. Hey, anytime, Chuck. I mean, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. And the, the names that you just listed, I mean, that is that is literally the dream team right there. I'm like... I, maybe I should just get my butt over there. You know, like I, I'll do whatever I can to be there. But the point is that there's just so much valuable information to be learned. And regardless of whatever tissue you're interested in, whether it's your brain, whether it's your thyroid health, whether it's your cardiovascular health, your diabetes health, you name it, plant-based nutrition is literally the gift that keeps on giving. And I thank you so much for being able to share this information with people every single day. You are relentless and I love you for it. I love you too, buddy. You are the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, <laughs> all right. That is all the time that we have today. I want to say thanks to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. And to you, exam roomies, thank you so very much for being here, hanging out, asking such great questions and raising your health IQ right alongside of us. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon, but until then, keep it plant-based. Oh, try that.